Welcome everyone to today's Saracen webinar. I'm just going to give it two more minutes before we kick off today and start at two minutes past the hour. Yeah, welcome everybody to today's Saracen webinar. For those of you who don't know me and are wondering about my strange accent, my name is Joe Burrows and I am a DevOps engineer who works here at Saracen remotely from New Zealand. So today we're talking about containers and how you can utilize them uh, within your dev and UAT environments. So a few a few housekeeping items before we get started today. Uh, this is a non-interactive webinar, so any questions you might have along the way, feel free to post them in the chat window and I'll do my best to answer them uh, near the end of today's uh, demonstrations. Uh, any questions I can't answer, I'll be sure to answer uh, via email after the webinar has ended. Today's webinar is also recorded and it's gonna be uploaded online to Team Vimeo. Uh, Team Saracen on our Vimeo channel and on our Saracen community. All our materials referenced today I've made available up on GitHub as well, so links to these URLs uh, will be shared on our final slide. Also, any comments or questions you might have at a later date, uh, feel free to shoot me an email, I'd be happy to help. Uh, my email address is joe.burrows at saracen.com. Agenda for today, uh, given we have a broad audience, uh, quite a number of attendees, uh, some may or may not have dabbled with containers, but I'm sure most people on the call here have at least heard of them. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is just go over a high level overview uh, with a bunch of different slides before going into some demonstrations. And I'll show you, you know, how you can build a Docker image for the Saracen portal, how you can run these images uh, with into containers and then how you can use them to improve your release management processes. So we at Saracen, we love using containers and you know, given the different amount of development life cycles we have to go through to build features and to test for you guys, you know, having this ability to quickly build and destroy an environment for validation testing is, is quite crucial uh, to our different workflows here internally. I'm sure some of these concepts uh, that I'm gonna go over uh, are gonna be helpful for everyone on this call as well. So a few takeaways that I've got um, that everyone can hopefully learn is how to make your Saracen portal portable, uh, to give you the ability to provide the portal locally or remotely for yourself, your developers, or any testers you might have within your company. The good thing about when you use Docker is you can literally work with it anywhere. So it could be on your Windows 10 workstation, 
It could be on a server in your data center, uh, or it could be up in the cloud. I'm also going to go over a advanced demo containerizing multiple portal instances in SQL. I'll show you how you can then roll back and roll forward the different portal versions using an environment file. And I'm going to show you how you can implement version control by pushing and pulling different tagged images from container repositories. I do have a quick poll before we get started. Um, just, I'm just curious to see what everyone's experience level is, you know, working with containers. So you should see up on your screen a few questions. I'll just give everyone about 30 seconds to go through and uh, do their best to answer it just to see where everyone's at. Yeah, it looks like most people have responded, which is great. I'm going to close the poll and just have a look at our results here. So we can see we've got a good mix. Uh, some haven't even heard, some are yet to hear of a container. Some have heard of them, and some are, some are starting to use them, uh, which is great. So hopefully, everyone on this call uh, can learn something. And hopefully, I'm not going to bore you all with too much. Uh, jargon. So I guess the first question, what is a container and why should you use them? So this is a pretty basic question, um, but it's important to understand if you don't already know. So a container is defined as a method to pack an application so it can be run with its dependencies isolated from different processes. So before we go any further with this definition, I think it's important to understand as well what the difference is to how an application runs in a virtual machine versus how it would run in a container. So a virtual machine is usually physical hardware which turns one server into many, as I'm sure you're all aware. HVM has its own virtual operating system, the application, and all the binaries it needs to run. Given each of these VMs have its own operating system, it tends to consume you know, a lot of uh, disk space. Uh, they can be slow to create and slow to boot, uh, which basically means uh, you're going to have a slow release time with a lot of waiting. I mean, Im imagine like being a Cyrusin developer or a third-party tester here internally. You know, you need a clean environment uh, each time you want to do a test, multiple times a day. So if you're relying on a virtual machine, there's a lot of time wasted spent uh, waiting for machines to spin up and then to clean up after them. I mean, automation can certainly help here, but there's still uh, a lot of time waiting for those processes to happen. So if you look at the same diagram for a container environment, you can see we have multiple containers which can all run on the same virtual machine uh, using the Docker platform. They share the operating system kernel with the containers and each application has its own isolated process. Containers, they can take up much less memory than a virtual machine. They can handle more applications and require fewer VMs and operating systems. I mean, once a container image is built, uh, it can literally be up and running in seconds and destroyed instantly. So if we compare this to the Cyrusin scenario where you're a developer, uh, they can now have a single virtual machine which acts as a Docker host, or you can have multiple if you want to cluster, and you can have it create a container uh, within seconds uh, rather than waiting for those boot times. So using the Docker platform, before we start running a container, uh, we must first build our container image. After we've got our image, we can then ship it up to our container repository. Uh, this makes it available across all our different Docker hosts and our machines that might be running, wanting to run that image. And once we've got an image, we can then run it. So in Docker, this is referred to as build, ship, and run.
So how do you build a container image? Well, the first thing you need is a Docker file. Now, a Docker file is basically an environment written in a text file. It's a bunch of command line instructions which tells Docker how it needs to install the application. A Docker file starts with a from parameter which declares the base image that the application will be installed from. In our cases, we're gonna be using the Windows Server core image uh, that's available from Microsoft's Docker Hub. Uh, for an application to be containerized, you must be able to fully automate the deployment of the application via command line. So luckily with the Cyrus and Portal, we actually ship uh, the install portal PS1 script with all our downloads, um, which is what the setup basically runs on. Uh, there's just a few little adjustments that you need to make to that script to make it work for a container, which is something I'll go over a bit later today uh, in the demonstration portion. After you have the Docker file created, you then run the commands docker build t to tag it with a name. This build runs through each step within your Docker file and creates like a layer snapshot to form uh, the final image. After we've got our image, we can then say docker push to push that image up into our container repository. Uh, it's free to sign up to Docker Hub where you can have, I think it's one private repository and the others public all for free. Uh, or if you're using Azure, you can sign up and use the Azure Container Registry service. Once the host has its image, the container can be run just by running the docker run command and this basically stands up your container based on the image and it's ready to go. So given containers aren't able to be AD joined and that the Cyrus and Portal relies heavily on Windows authentication to connect to Service Manager, I think it's important to understand how you know, permissions work in a container for Windows authentication. So if I look at this diagram here, uh, what, what you can do is create a group managed service account in a cred spec file, uh, which I'll go over later. Uh, it's also well documented on the Microsoft Docs website. What this means is any service that runs in the container as local system will, can then impersonate your group managed service account. So you can see here, my web app one uh, within local system within local system within the container is going out to connect into the SQL Server as my web app one. So you can get Windows authentication without containers needing to be an object uh, in your Active Directory. So let's see, see this all in action. I'm just gonna come over to my Docker host here. So this first part of the demo is something I blogged about in the Cyrus community early last year. I've since improved upon it quite a bit, uh, which is what I'm gonna go over for the, the second part of today's demonstration. But I think the concepts that you learn here in you know, working with a single container and a, building a single image uh, helps a lot before you get on to more advanced sort of orchestration concepts to build multiple containers. Uh, throughout this demo, I'm using Visual Studio Code, uh, which you can download for free. It makes working with Docker a lot simpler as it has this plugin here called Docker Explorer. Uh, this basically allows you to you know, visually see all your containers, uh, all your images, and everything that's up in your Docker Hub repository or your Azure Container Registry. Uh, just saves working with the CLI as much, um, and it gives you right-click commands um, for working with them. So the first thing we wanna do is have a look at our Docker file, uh, which is what I've got up here. So it starts with our from parameter, which is telling it that for this particular image, it's gonna be built. The base image is gonna be Microsoft's .NET Framework 3.5 image, which 
basically just has .NET Framework 3.5 pre-installed. When we do our Docker build, it's going to pull that down from Microsoft, or you can run Docker pull and the image name to pull it down locally. It has a bunch of args, which are where the where Docker is going to download our zip file from, and each of the parameters needed in our install portal PS1 script, uh, which you can pull out of your zip file and have a look at uh, all the parameters it needs. We're telling Docker to use PowerShell for its shell commands, so any commands is going to be run in PowerShell. Our run instructions are telling it which commands to run. So in here, you can see these two lines are creating a local administrator user. We're then exposing port 80 and 443. Now, this is only needed if you are working with a custom Docker network, which in my case, I am I'm using a transitive network. Uh, but I can go over that a bit later. Creating two directories. Downloading the zip file from the internet. Downloading a few custom scripts into my container. Unblocking that zip file. Extracting that zip file. And then I'm running the portal prerequisite script, um, which comes, which sets everything up. Then I'm removing the default website that's set up uh, when IIS first gets installed. Next, I'm doing a replace on the install portal script. Now, what this is doing is replacing the app pool identity to use local system, uh, which is setting it as two, where it was previously three, which is telling it to use a Windows, a Windows local user or, or Active Directory user. So this makes our permissions work, so it can impersonate our group managed service account. Then we're installing the portal from all of our build args above. And then what we're doing is we're removing the custom space folder. So what we want to do is make it easy to work with custom space. So you don't want to have to attach into the container and do everything via the command line. So what you can do when you run the container is you can tell it to mount a volume locally on our host uh, to a folder on the container. So here I have my container volume. It's got everything I need for my custom space. So whenever I run a Docker container, it's going to pull in those particular customizations. Just makes it a bit easier. Uh, then it's going to run this custom script to update the service. So after the cache builder and platform cache has been installed, it's going to be installed as a Windows user. So I've got a little script that runs here that just switches it from Windows from a Windows user into using local system. Again, so our permissions can work. Now we have a Docker file. We're ready to build our image. So if we come over here and have a look, I have our build command already set. So we're saying we want to run Docker build. We want to tag it with this particular image name. So DevOps 010 is just my repository on Docker Hub, telling it the application name is going to be SMP to tag it with, and I'm telling it I want to tag it with this particular version. Uh, so in this case, it's 900. I'm telling it which cred spec to use uh, to impersonate that group managed service account. Uh, I need to declare that at my build time because it is going out to SQL Server to create it on my SQL, create the databases on my SQL VM. And then you can override any of your build args um, here at runtime rather than having to update your Docker file. So rather, rather than run through this, it takes about 15 minutes to build that image. Uh, so I have pre-built it as you can see in the left hand side here, um, I've got 900 already created. So I've outputted that to a log file so you can see what's happened. So you can see it's run through each instruction in the Docker file and basically created a layer. So if we scroll down, 
you can see it's downloaded my zip file from our downloads location, downloaded our custom scripts. It's gone through and run the install portal prereq script, set up all of our um, server roles and features, and installed all the MSIs the portal needs to run. And then it's gone through and executed our install portal, installed our services, executed our DAC. Go all the way to the bottom. It's updated our cache builder to run as local system and restarted. It's updated our platform cache to run as local system and restarted. And then it has successfully tagged the image with the tag name that we've declared. Now we've got an image. We can come and run that image. So here again, we're just running our Docker run command. We're saying Docker run. Uh, as I'm using a custom network, I'm telling it my custom network name. Otherwise, you'd have to net the ports using the default network and say, I want to net, I want to net port 80 on my host to port 80 in my container. Uh, with trans, uh, transparent networks, you can give it its own IP address, uh, which is what I like working with a little bit better telling it what my DNS server is, telling it what my DNS suffix is, uh, mapping the volume from this directory on my host to this directory within my container, giving it a host name. Uh, in this case, with Windows Server 2016, if you're using cred spec files, you have to match your host name with the name of your cred spec. Within server 2019, they've fixed this, so you don't need to worry about that if your your host is on server 2019. And then I'm telling it my Docker image name, uh, which is from that variable there. So let's run this. Okay, and you can see in Docker Explorer here, it's created my container. And now if I come in and go to that particular static IP address I've given it. Give it a moment to come fully online. Still come in. We now have our 909 up and running uh, with our customizations uh, from the mounted container volume. I can come and log in with my Windows credentials and get the portal up and running. So from here, we can do all the testing that we need. And when we're, when we're finished, we can just come and say Docker stop, or we can just right click on our container, stop it, remove it. It's gone. If we wanted to push that image up into the DevOps repo, we can just come right click here and go push. That will make it available on Docker Hub uh, for our other hosts to download. Uh, so they don't need to run through the build commands. They can just do a quick pull, uh, which it'll do automatically if it can't detect the image locally, which is kind of cool. So that's, uh, that's a basic Docker build process. Uh, so that's a little slow, it's a little a little bit clunky with all the different CLI, uh, and it's kind of the reason why I thought it didn't get too much traction when I posted it early last year on the community. So if we wanna look at something a bit more advanced and say we wanna now stand up SQL Server to be in a container rather than use our uh, service, manage, service manager 
SQL instance. And we want to say build two different environments at the same time as well, one for our UIT environment and one for our dev environment. Come back to our slides here. So this is where Docker Compose comes in. So with a Compose YAML file, you can reference multiple Docker files and build and run all your containers with a single command, Docker Compose up. Then when you're ready, when you finish your testing, all you need to say is Docker Compose down and it'll bring down that entire environment and do all the cleanup. So that's nice and simple and it avoids all those long-winded commands I've just shown you. Uh, so let's see that in action. So this part of the demo I have posted up online on GitHub. I've included some instructions on, you know, exactly what you need to get it up and running. Uh, so you can come and download that. I'll share that link a bit later in the slide decks. Uh, let's have a look at our YAML file first. So our YAML file it starts with a version to declare which version our YAML file references. In this case, I'm using 3.6. If you have a look on the Docker docs, uh, you can see all the different um, reference sheets for what you get in which different versions. Uh, with Docker Compose, you define each container as a service. So you can see here I have three services. I've got a SQL service, I've got a portal dev service, and I've got a portal UAT service. So we're running three containers here. We come and look at our SQL service. You can see we're declaring the same sort of things as we would with our Docker build or run commands. We're telling it the image. In this case, for SQL, I'm using a customized uh, SQL image. Now this is pretty much exactly the same as the one Microsoft have published on their Docker Hub repo. I've just tweaked it slightly. Uh, we can go over those tweaks uh, when we have a look at the Docker file for SQL. Setting my host name to match my cred spec file. Setting my volume path for my custom space. Um, sorry, that's for SQL. So that's just a volume to work with SQL. Setting a bunch of environment variables. Setting, giving it an IP address because I'm using a transparent network. Setting my DNS server, setting my DNS su suffix. Now you can see here I am using environment variables. So with Docker Compose, if you can specify all your variables in an ENV file. So it just makes it a little bit easier. That way you only have one file to update as you're changing things. Next is my portal dev service. I'm telling it it depends on SQL. So the portal service is never going to come up until SQL is up and running. Giving it my image name here. In this case, it changes depending on which version I declare in my environment file. Now, if this image doesn't exist, either in my repository or locally on my Docker host, it's going to go and run through a build command and basically build that image um, so it's available locally. So specifying all my environment variables here too. Now these are just the parameters it needs for the install portal script, so I can change them um, from my environment file here. Say I want to give it a different application name or give it a different management database name. It can all be specified here. My portal UAT environment depends on SQL and it depends on portal dev. Uh, it's got a slightly different image name because my um, configuration might be slightly different, so we want to save it to a different image name. Uh, we are using a different version because we might want to use a different version bet between our dev and our UAT environment. And at the very bottom, I'm specifying the network. 
again, I'm using my custom transparent network. Um, you just need to swap that to NAT if you wanted to NAT uh, to the IP address of the Docker host. Before we compose that up, let's have a look at each of the Docker files. So we'll start with our SQL Docker file. So if we come to Microsoft's repository here, you can see I've used basically the exact same Docker file with a few differences. Uh, one being that I'm enabling full text search because the portal needs full text search to work. I've also added an environment variable here to be able to specify your group managed service account usernames. And then I've modified the startup script that's run to basically add those usernames as a sysadmin to the SQL instance. That way, when our portal start, uh, those specified group managed service accounts have permission to SQL so they can you know, add a database and run those decks. Next up is our portal Docker file. This is a little bit different to the one I've showed you earlier because I've made it, I've improved upon it to make it a bit quicker. So the first thing here, rather than use our Windows Server core image, we're using a customized SMP prec image. So if we come and have a look at that one. Now this is basically just setting up all the prerequisites the portal needs and saving it into an image. So rather than you know running through the installation of all those roles, features, and MSIs every time the portal's run, um, we've got that pre-built into our um, prereq Im image. Um, so you can see here I'm downloading the zip file, ex extracting that zip, also downloading to 2017 DAC framework MSIs. So what we're doing here is we're using SQL Server 2017. So we just need these later DAC, uh, these later DAC frameworks set up. We're installing our prereqs and then we're removing our default website and then basically cleaning up all those files we've downloaded. Jump back to our Docker file for the portal. So it's going to use that. It's going to stand that up straight away. It's going to go through all our arguments. It's going to set up our local administrator user. It's going to expose port 80 and 443. It's going to set up a few directories. Download our zip from whichever version we've declared in our environment file, extract that zip file, copy a few scripts. In this case, it's our update server script. And there's another one here, which is the connection string workaround. So if we have a look at that file, all it's doing is a simple replace on our install portal. And it's just fixing up this current bug where the installer expects the uh, SQL instance to be the same as where service manager is, uh, which won't be the case here because we're putting our service management database in a separate instance within a container. Um, so that's open as PR83541. So soon that'll be fixed out of the box. Then replacing our app pool identity uh, to run as local system. Uh, there's a counter that got added to wait for the platform to sync. So I'll speed that up a little bit. So rather than wait for the platform to sync the first time, we're going to skip that because it's not going to be able to sync until our update service script is run. We're then going to run our connection string workaround. And then we're going to install the portal. So here we're going to install the website files only in our Docker image. This is because the SQL service won't exist until the SQL container is up and running. So our image is only going to contain our install scripts and the website files pre-installed. 
where they're gonna remove our custom space folder. And then we have our CMD, CMD instruction. So this is saying every time a container is started, it's gonna run through this particular script. So it's gonna wait 15 seconds. This is going to allow SQL container time to come online. Or they're gonna check if the cache build is installed. If it's not, we're gonna then run and install our database and install our services. Uh, not the website, obviously, because that's already installed. Then we're gonna update our platform cache and our cache builder to run as local system. And then we're gonna tail the log, just so we got some verbose logging. So if we come and before we compose up, let's have a look at what we're declaring in our environment file. You can see I'm gonna stand my UAT environment up on 904 and our dev environment, they're a little bit ahead. We want them to be dev testing on 909. So you can see in Docker Explorer here, these images already exist, 904, 909. Uh, so it's not going to go ahead and build the image, it's just going to stand them up. So if we say docker compose up, it's creating our SQL server from our image, it's creating our portal dev server on 909, it's creating our UAT server on 904. You can see this again here on the left hand side that it's standing these up. You can see our SQL server has started and it's running that startup script. It's added our group managed service accounts as sysadmin to the SQL container. Our portal servers have waited their 15 seconds, so they're going to go ahead and install their services. Uh, the different colors indicate the different containers, so one's our UAT, one's our dev. Probably going to take about a minute, so we'll just give it some time to run through and install our services and then replace them as local system. And we should be up and running. Uh, so you can see here I am referencing for our custom space volume the same location for both our both our UAT and our dev environment. So that way when we connect to our containers, uh, we can work our customizations across multiple versions, uh, all from the one place. So that's kind of handy if you wanna you know, make sure your customizations are gonna work cross version. Uh, you don't have to copy and paste them to different VMs or different servers. Um, you've got them all mounted here uh, from the one place uh, to do your to do your testing basically. Okay, installing the platform cache. We can't initialize the platform cache, which is to be expected as it's still running as that local user we created. The UAT environment still is running out through our decks. Dev environment is updating the cache builder to run as local system. Cache builder is starting in our dev environment.
UAT is just timed out now, so we're just waiting for that to flick to local system. Dev environments tailed our logs, um, which has got a few errors from when it first tried to run. That's okay because we expect errors until it's flicked to local system. Just waiting for UAT to tail its log and we'll see if we can connect to our containers. So this is running uh, Docker Compose up with an attached mode so we can see exactly what it's doing. If you didn't want to see all this logging in your terminal, you'd just say docker compose up dash dash d uh, to run the detached mode. Oh, and just waiting for it to tail. Oh, our cache build is up now. So yeah, just like that, we have three containers running. We've got a SQL server, we've got a UAT, environment when we've got a dev environment. So if we try access those static IPs, still might take just a moment for the website to come up. Not quite up yet. Cool, we've got our portal v909 for our dev environment. And we've got our UIT environment running 904. So once you've got your environment files uh, configured, it makes it very easy to come and set up the portal. Um, quite a very hands-off deployment. Um, all we did is told it to run, do a Docker run, and we have our entire system set up. Uh, so let's license that, license this. So this license is going to die after today, in case you try to use it. Um, So that's creating a new database. Uh, if you had already an existing database that you wanted to attach, uh, you can do that uh, with the container, the SQL container image that I've referenced. Uh, they do have an example here on how you would do that um, up on the Microsoft site here. You just need to specify the attached, attached DBs um, environment and specify an adjacent string format. Um, so, uh, if you didn't want to create a new database and you had one pre-populated with everything that you wanted, you just need to specify that at your runtime. Cool. So here we have our portals up and running. So what happens if we decide that hey, we want to we're still doing our testing, but we want to bring UIT up to 909 now. It's passed its, it's passed all its uh, dev tests, and we want to bring that up. So rather than do Docker Compose and destroy everything and then bring it all back up, what we can do is just stop our containers.
uh, which you do by just uh, exiting out of control setting out or you can right click and say stop come into our environment file and say hey I want UAT to be 909 make that single change tell it to compose back up it's going to detect no changes and a container is already there for SQL and dev so it's just going to start those stopped containers back up and then it's going to detect a change for UAT and recreate that whole container uh, using our new image, which in this case is 909. Started our SQL server. And it's waiting the 15 seconds and it's going to go through that same process uh, to move UAT into 909. And as it's not recreating our SQL server, that same database instance from 904 will already exist. It's already licensed. So it's just going to go through like an upgrade scenario on that database. So what happens, so rather than wait for that, what happens if we decide that a new, a new version drops from Cyrus in 9010? You can see we don't have an image for that here or on our uh, Docker Hub repository, but we want dev to be on 9010. We say 9010, Docker Compose up. You can see instantly it's detected that 9010 doesn't exist, so it's going to go through, it's going to find our Docker file and it's going to build an image for 9010. So you can see it's created our local users, our local admin user. And the next step, it's going to go out and download the zip for 9010. I'll expose our ports now, download the zip. And yeah, go through that full uh, Docker build process. Close out of that rather than run through it. Might have to wait. Um, so yeah, you can see it's you know very simple to use. Um, I'll just show you some quick commands that might be helpful just to get you started. Uh, so if we say Docker images, it's going to show us all the images that we've got built. You can see some of these images here. A failed builds and um, hasn't been tagged so if you're doing a lot of if you're testing new docker images you'll probably run into this a lot it's always good to clean up after yourself it's just to save on space so if you just say docker rmi to remove image and the image id that will then clean up those layers and say docker ps to see which Containers are currently running. You can see here it is uh, one of the containers from my build command. Uh, after that exits out, it'll close that container automatically. Docker ps a is going to show us all our all containers, including those that are stopped. So you can see my compose containers are up here still. You could say Docker network to show me my Docker networks. And you can see I've got uh, two custom networks um, running transparent driver. One's DHCP enabled, one's just static. And the default one you get out of the box is NAT and null. So when I'm finished all my testing and I want to free up my resources, I just say docker compose down. And that cleans up all my containers, frees up my resources, and I'm ready to go. So yeah, I'd recommend coming through and checking this article out here. It explains exactly what you need. I've given you all the Docker files, uh, the YAML files, and the environment file. So all you've got to do basically is once you've set up your Docker host, um, just go and adjust 
your environment file. Which looks like I need to add that here. Uh, so yeah, I'd recommend just going through the steps that we've gone through today. Um, getting comfortable with using it manually, and then as you build up more experience, you can start to leverage you know, CI, CD pipelines to manage your containers end-to-end -end and really speed up your release management process. Uh, so we do have time for a bit of questions. If anyone has any questions, just chuck them in the chat window, and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, one we've got here is, Can you email out the Vimeo link to all attendees this week? Yes, I believe it's going out uh, today, but I'll confirm that with our marketing team. How do the portal permissions, how do the portal permissions work with Service Manager? Uh, so that's no, no different to uh, how they're working today. So if we come and have a look at our Service Manager instance, um, you can't actually add your group managed service accounts directly uh, to the administrator role. So what I've done is I've got a group added here called SCSM admins, and then in Active Directory users and computers, I've added that group managed service account as a member of that group. That way it has full permissions to service manager um, to be able to do what it needs to do. What is the URL of the GitHub to download? Uh, I'll share that on my final slide. Uh, I'll also add a link to it in the community. Can you use containers in a production environment? Yes, there's nothing stopping you. I know uh, more and more people are starting to leverage containers in production. Um, Certainly makes it an easy way to scale out your portal um, if you can start to use orchestrators. Um, so yeah, you can use it wherever you want. Uh, yeah, would there be any issues running multiple Docker containers containering different SMP against the same SCSM dev instance? Uh, no, it's, I mean, we we use um, Herosiris and we have about 10 or, uh, we have up to 10 containers running against the same dev service manager instance. You just have to be aware of um, all the read writes to and from your service manager database. But if you've got this, if you've got plenty of resource there and you've, you know, planned for all those extra activity, you should be fine. Uh, so yeah, next steps are, I guess, to review the read up, readme setup I've put on our GitHub, uh, join the discussion on the Saracen community, and if you have any questions or comments or issues, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to help. Uh, I think you know once you get over the initial hurdle of uh, learning the different commands and getting it up and running, there's uh, a lot of power in here, so I'm help, happy to help with any of those hurdles you might have um, starting out. With that, I'd like to leave the webinar here. So I thank everyone for joining, and I hope you've all learned something that you can utilize, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening. Thank you very much.